Hello, Jimmy here, welcome back. Today we're... Box. I'm gonna jump around back to front. I'm a professional. That's nice. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about the Norse... Oh, f microphone. Where is it? It's in the car, it's in the car. It's in, it's in the car. Will you just... Okay. Oh, such a week. Okay. Oh, what a week. Okay, let's try that again. So a lot of people have been asking me things about the Norse in North America and the Vikings in North America and were there Vikings in the USA and all that kind of garbage. And the answer is obviously no, because there was no USA during the Viking Age. <laughs> but there were Norse people in North America. And that's what we're going to talk about. <laughs> I'm assuming that a lot of you guys have probably already heard of Vinland and Lanzo Meadows and if you have, that's great. Feel free to like pop more info in the comments. If you have any that you think would be relevant, that'd be great. We're all here to learn, we're all here to share stuff, and we're all here to have a good time. There's a lot of kind of nonsense spouted about the Norse in North America and what they actually got up to and what evidence we actually really have about their activities there. So let's start right at the very beginning. This story actually starts in... Iceland with a man called Erik Thorvaldsson. And Erik Thorvaldsson is better known as Erik the Red. You might have heard of Erik the Red. And the story goes that his father, Thorvald, uh, was accused of manslaughter and was banished. And so they had to leave their home. Their home was originally in Norway, so little Erik moves to Iceland where they are banished to. So when uh, Eric gets older, some trouble happens that involves um, some of his thralls, his slaves, causing a landslide. Eric gets involved in a fight with one of his neighbours, kills him, is exiled temporarily, comes back, tries to get some of his possessions, fails, kills some more people, and is exiled again, and then has to go to Greenland. So he goes to Greenland and settles there, and uh, apparently names the place Greenland to make it more attractive to people. So more people will come and settle in Greenland because it's called Greenland. So although Eric the Red is credited with settling Greenland for the Norse, he's not the first man from Europe to have seen it. There was a man called Gunnbjorn Ulfsson a century earlier who's credited in the Icelandic sagas with actually seeing Greenland for the first time. So eventually, after three years uh, of being in Greenland, Eric gets to go back to Iceland, because his exile is only for three years, they're not that bad, and he goes there with tales of this new land called Greenland, where everything is rosy and you could set up a new farm if you want, and I'll give all of my followers new land if you come with me. This is in the 980s, and he manages to recruit people. He recruits enough of these gullible people from Iceland to go back with him in 25 ships. That's quite a lot of people. 11 of the ships are sunk. They're lost at sea, because it's treacherous around there. There's lots of ice, there's lots of storms, it's not great. And 14 of these ships get there, and they have two settlements. They have one which is near Nuuk, which is now the capital of Greenland, and they have another one near Kakar... Kakartok? Kakartok? Kakortok. And I apologise if there are any uh, Greenlanders, or if there are any Inuit people watching, that I, and I've horribly butchered your place names, I did try and I apologise, I'm sorry. Eric manages to go uh, over to Greenland with his, his settlers, and we've actually got quite a lot of evidence of trade and of, uh, you know, contact with native people, and these native people are not the Dorset culture, as is often, like, thrown out there, people are like, oh yeah, Dorset culture, Dorset culture, it's n they're not the Dorset culture, um, they are effectively proto-Inuit people. Um, they were encountering people like the, the Beotuk people um, and Proto-Inuit people living in and around Newfoundland. They were, yeah. they were encouraging trade with these people. We've got lots of things. We've got carpentry tools. We've got gaming pieces. We've got nails for ships. So clench, clench nails uh, for ship building uh, and other tools made of iron that wouldn't have been known in the area. 
before Europeans had arrived. So we know that they were trading. We know that there was lots of uh, trade back and forth. Seal skins, ivory, uh, narwhal tusks, various other items were being traded to the Norse. Um, and I'm going to be using the word Norse because like, there are people from Iceland, there are people from Norway, there are people from Greenland, all of whom have this sort of uh, cultural unity that we're just going to call Norse for now because it makes things easier. So they were trading and they were living there and it seems to have gone kind of semi-okay. The problems start coming in the later medieval period. So throughout the period of the sort of early medieval and high medieval periods, Greenland is this semi-Norwegian, uh, almost independent country. Norway and then sort of Denmark, Norway, always considers it, considers it a possession. They always consider Greenland to be theirs. Um, but they're far away, it's difficult to get to, and they basically live most of the time on their own. So they're, they're living there, they're farming there. It's getting colder and it's getting more humid, which means that grazing land, pasture land, gets more difficult to come by. They have to slaughter their herds every winter to stay alive. So their buyers are always empty, and then their, their food supplies are getting lower and lower. And as the climate gets colder, we get what's called the Little Ice Age in the medieval period. By the 14th and 15th century, the population is starting to decline. People are leaving. There are fewer people staying there. There are fewer people being born. So the most recent... Uh, radiocarbon date we have is plus minus 50 years, 1430. So it's sort of between sort of 1415, 1445, the last European evidence in Greenland just kind of just kind of trickles to nothing. You know, the last couple of old people in Greenland are still living in their turf house, and then when they die, there's nobody left to take over the farm. The animals either escape or die in their pens. Everything turns to crap. Finito. Uh, in the 1700s and 1720s, uh, a Norwegian-Danish expedition goes to Greenland and stuff starts up interest in the place again. Um, there had been expeditions there before, there had been Danish expeditions up to Greenland um, in the 15 and 1600s, they hadn't really worked out. Uh, there's a minister called Egerda, who in 1721 goes up there with some followers and colonists, doesn't find any surviving European settlers in Greenland, starts baptising the Inuit as reformed Christians, and that's where the kind of reassertion of European dominance in that part of North America comes in. So where does the, the whole Vikings in North America thing fit into this? Because we've been talking about Icelanders, and we've been talking about Norwegians, and we've been talking about Danes up to now. Well, according to the Icelandic sagas, uh, Eric the Red's son, Leif, Leifur, Eric's son, Eric's son, because he is Eric's son, goes west. He goes further west. Um, and he goes west because one of his father's settlers, a man called Bjarni, who is blown off course, he's one of those 14 ships that makes it to Greenland, he's blown off course, sees a new landmass and sees like rocks and does tide mapping and plots routes and all kinds of stuff, and then just saves this for a while after he goes back to Greenland presumably talks to Leif Erikson over the fire one day and is like, oh yeah, I got all these like bits of vellum, I assume, with like charts and maps and stuff on them. You want them? You can go sail with them. They're perfectly usable as navigational tools, still. I'm just like guessing. This is all from the saga, so most of it's probably bullcrap. Now, according to the sagas, Leif goes on a big expedition and discovers three areas. Helloland, land of the flat stones, or flatland, Markland, forested land, and Vinland. Wineland, or Vinland, meaning pasture land. Everybody's kind of gone with it being Vinland because there's also a legendary story of his foster father being found drunk on wine at one point when they make a winter camp there, and this is set in AD 1001. So, in AD 1001, Leif Erikson is wintering, theoretically, somewhere in Newfoundland and Labrador. In 1004, his brother Thorvald Eriksson um, attacks a group of native people who are apparently sleeping under their canoes and after brief hostilities uh, I think Thorvald is killed when an arrow shoots him. Is that is he killed or is he just injured? He's killed. Um, and 
that is 1004, AD 1004. In AD 1009, we get a third expedition that goes across there, uh, and this is sort of the last big one that we hear about in the sagas. So this is led by Thorfinn Karlsefni, and apparently he, he sort of leads 160 or 250, depending on the source, because none of these things are reliable, and he takes his settlers over to Vinland. And when he gets there, they meet native people, they trade things like uh, milk and uh, red cloth for grey squirrel fur, which is kind of cool that, that like, grey squirrels are mentioned as a tradable item, that's kind of neat, and furs and various other things. And uh, then at some point a bull gets loose, scares the native people, and they come back in force and attack the Norse with a large dark blue pig's bladder sized thing on a pole that makes a horrible noise and scares everybody so they all run away back to their ships. Uh, Leif's sister-in-law, stepsister, Freydis, uh, is pregnant, picks up a sword, tears her bodice open, which isn't a thing in this period, and you know, this is what happens when your sources were written three, four hundred years after this is meant to have happened. Um, obviously displays her chest to the enemy, picks up a dead man's sword, terrifies them and they all run away. So we'll take that with a, a massive, with half a kilogram of salt, shall we? So this is kind of where things start to peter out. There's a lot of um, hostile encounters with the natives. There's very little there that they actually really desperately need. Like they can, yes, they can get furs, but they can get furs at home and they don't really need that much from these native people. There's timber and there's berries, but meh. They're building turf houses most of the time and they're doing without a vast amount of timber available in Greenland anyway. And the hostility of the natives just kind of is the straw that breaks the camel's back. So this seems to be the end of what the Norse got up to in North America. That's the furthest extent. It's still awesome though. So that's effectively Leif Erikson and what he got up to there, and what effectively you have in these places are wintering camps or way stations. They're not permanent settlements, they don't have like grand long hauls built of timber and massive walls, uh, they're not particularly impressive, they're not castles like Trelleborg in Denmark and places like that. What you will have is turf built houses and smaller little storerooms, like at Lanzo Meadows we've got what, three houses? And they're not particularly massive. The long houses at Trelleborg are 26 meters long, and these are kind of titchy and unimpressive by comparison. They're still cool though, they'd still provide a lot of warmth, they'd be great insulation. Uh, we do have, you know, all of the trappings of people living there. We have bits of tools and equipment and things like that, uh, and weaponry and, and burning, evidence of cooking and farm animals. But most of the animals that we're seeing there are things like seals and whales, and I think one cod. <laughs> the bones from one cod. So these guys don't have lots of domestic animals with them. They don't have lots of cattle and pigs and goats and sheep and dogs and cats and you know they they're basically using what they can get. They're fishing, they're hunting, they're trading. So what about the whole wine grapes thing? We now think it's possible that there were things like cranberries and squash berries that they were encountering that may have been fermented. These guys may have fermented some of these fruits to just try and make something nice to drink. And that may have been the wine, the vin, that was actually being talked about. It's also possible that this is just a mistranslation, uh, that instead of it being vinland, it should be vinland, and it is just pastureland and meadowland. And a lot of people's argument against that is, well, that's not very impressive compared to Wineland, but neither is forested land or flat stone land. So where are these places? Is Lanzo Meadows Vinland? We don't know. It might be, but there are thoughts that Helleland might be Baffin Island. Uh, there is potentially evidence from Baffin Island that there's Norse contact there, that there's stuff there. They found some rope, they found some cordage. Is Newfoundland Vinland? It might be. There's possibly evidence at a place called Point Rossi that there was Norse settlement there, but we don't know. It's kind of inconclusive right now. And it's it's difficult to know in areas as large as this. Like, bear in mind how big this area is compared to Iceland and the areas of Greenland that they settled. This is vast territory. So finding temporary settlements 
where people stopped for a few days or a few months or even a couple of years is really, really difficult, especially after a thousand years. We didn't know Lonzo Meadows was there until 1960 when Arne Ingestad excavated it. So this stuff does get lost. Do we have evidence that the Vikings got further into North America? No. No, we don't. We don't have any evidence at all that the Vikings got any further than this. Nuh uh, none. Any of the evidence that people try to present is almost always immediately outed as fake. Things like the rune stones, you better believe there's going to be a rune stones video. Things like that are just bad fakes, wishful thinking. And I get it, I get the wishful thinking side of things. You know, I really want somebody to find the actual tomb of King Arthur someday, but. It's just not a thing that we're going to get anytime soon. But I think that this is just wanting more than we need. This is greed. This is greed. This is us being sort of historically and archaeologically greedy. Because we have evidence. We've got plentiful evidence. We know that people in the Viking Age got to North America. Eric the Red got to Greenland in the 980s. I'm sorry, but Greenland is physically, geographically, North America. The Norse got there. If he ever did any pirating in his life, which we don't know, or any of his crew or any of his friends and family that went with him did any pirate activity or raiding in their lives, that means that a Viking went to North America. That should be enough. We also know that Norse people, the descendants of Eric the Red, got to Newfoundland. That's incredible. The Vikings got across the Atlantic. 500 years before Columbus. That mad, evil human being managed to do it himself. The Vikings got there. The Norse got there. So there you go. Did the Norse get to North America? Hell to the yes, they did. Did they colonize the whole of the USA and build runestones in Minnesota? Seems unlikely. Thank you very much once again for joining. I do hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do subscribe. Feel free to chuck me some pennies on coffee or take a look at the Patreon if you're interested in supporting the channel. And until the next time, as ever, who will I'm a troll? Bye for now.